Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's public lecture. This is the fifth in our series for this year. Um, my name is Sam Lundrigan. I'm the director of PEER, the Policing Institute for the Eastern Region, and we've been delighted to host this series of lectures around crime and policing in the pandemic. Um, we're absolutely delighted this evening to welcome Jackie Kilburn from Women's Aid here to talk to us about um, women's aid's work around domestic abuse during the pandemic and their responses and support for victim survivors. Um, before I introduce Jackie, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about how the um, session will go. So we have around an hour, an hour and a half. Jackie will speak for around 45 minutes. There'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So please do feel free to um, write any comments or questions in the Q&A. Um, uh, stream that will be live uh, from the moment we start. Uh, we, we always welcome your input um, and that, as I say, there'll be plenty of just time for discussions afterwards. Um, so if I just take a moment to introduce Jackie. Um, Jackie manages the National Training Centre at Women's Aid um, and is a qualified teacher, trainee and assessor. She's also an associate trainer for the College of Policing and in May 2015 supported HMIC with inspecting some of the 43 police service areas, which resulted in recommendations around face to face training on domestic abuse and coercive control to all police forces in the country. Jackie is um, passionate about awareness raising and keeping domestic abuse and the effects of it visible. She believes that training and education are absolutely central to this. Um, and she's absolutely passionate about survivors' voices being heard so as to really influence policy and practice. She's facilitated survivor thematic focus groups for the Home Office, the Department of Work and Pensions and many others. And we're absolutely delighted that she's here tonight to join us. So without further ado, I will hand over to Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I will just put this onto a slide share. Right. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I feel very privileged um, when I see the audience and I just want to make it very clear that uh, Women's Aid are four federations. So before I start, I'm representing England and the research that I'm going to be showing that we've done with survivors is from Women's Aid Federation England. There are other pieces of research that there will have been done in Northern Ireland uh, by Women's Aid, Scotland and Wales. So if any of you are really interested in that from those particular nations, I do urge you to get in touch with those um, particular Women's Aid Federations. OK, um, to start with, I just want to make it really clear that we absolutely know that um, policing and the res and have responded really positively to the pandemic and worked really, really hard to try and adapt the way that they serve the public, just like all of us have done. Um, we've all shown great innovation in the way that we've dealt with the pandemic. And we know that there's been huge delays and backlogs in the criminal justice system, but everyone is working really hard um, to keep survivors safe. Um, Women's Aid, um, they've had 91% increase for their online support. So that tells you how there's been a huge sea change during the pandemic about survivors and how they have wanted to respond. And unfortunately, that has been because of a lot of some of the limitations that have been put to them. I want to concentrate on two aspects, the pandemic, um, how that has changed the world for survivors of domestic abuse, but also about from coercion as well, um, controlling and coercive behaviour. This is what perpetrators um, have increased during the pandemic. And I am aware that the audience isn't all about policing. So some of you will be very familiar with what I'm going to show you. Some of you will not be. So the first thing I want to say about coercion is that for professionals, it's invisible. And I think this is what the difficulty a lot of people have with um, observing it. So what we see when we think about coercion is we see the effects of coercion. 
it's always there but when we're operating in the world as a professional we're seeing the effects of it we're seeing the effects of all the different strategies of coercion and control that perpetrators of domestic abuse use we also know that it is extremely harf harmful quite difficult but not impossible to evidence and we know that financial control is a big part of coercion as well and that is often what prevents survivors from leaving where there's um, extensive financial control that cuts off even more routes um, to being free than would normally be. I want to, before we go into the pandemic, I want us to think about and remind ourselves what coercion really is. So I know we've got lots of different professionals in the room and I'm going to um, ask you, you're not, I don't want you to answer, but what I'm going to ask you is, I am sure that many of you have taken statements from uh, survivors of domestic abuse. Also, many of you will have sat and listened to survivors of domestic abuse tell you about their abusive relationships. I can almost guarantee nearly 100%, there are always exceptions to the rule, that when you ask them what their relationship was like in the beginning, they've always said it was great, it was good. And that is because they're telling the truth. They're explaining to you about their relationship. The reason for that is because there's a conditioning process that takes place and it's extremely difficult to recognise because it's the same as when you enter into a healthy relationship. So when we enter into relationships, whether they're healthy or abusive, perpetrators and non-abusive people generally behave in exactly the same way. They all show their best sides. They all adapt slightly to that other person's world and they do that for quite some time. The difference between a perpetrator of domestic abuse and someone in a healthy relationship is that usually when it's an abusive relationship, it's much more intensive. So some people call it love bombing these days. It's a new expression um, or gaslighting. But what generally happens is it becomes intensive very quickly. So they will be told that they're, they're, they've fallen in love with them, that everything that they like and believe, uh, they do too. If it's a single person with children, they'll be saying that they adore children. So it is a type of conditioning that is really difficult to believe. And what we do know about abusive relationships is that they always usually start like that. And if you think about it, Early on in a relationship, on a first two or three dates, if someone behaved in an extremely abusive way towards you, you would be able to leave that relationship very easily because there are no ties there, none whatsoever, including love. Perpetrators of abuse know this, and this is why we know that it's a deliberate act. So that conditioning takes place, and usually it's not until they move in with each other that things change slightly still coercive nature of the of of that relationship applies but there are changes that are made very early on those changes are very subtle there'll be comments about how they look who they mix with the fact that they don't like them seeing the friends and the family as often and the people that are watching i'm guessing know this but i just wanted us to remind ourselves about how that actually happens because what eventually happens is it creates a dependency so survivors of domestic abuse get to a point in the relationship where they've been trying to adapt to that perpetrator as well continually to get that person back that they had in the beginning that actually never existed but they work very hard of it, hard at it. And in the end, they believe what they are told by the perpetrator. So they go through some stages that I'm going to show you in a minute. And they believe everything they're told. They start to believe it's their fault. They start to believe that they can't actually cope without this person. And that is why you get this dependency that happens. <laughs> 
And what that does is entrap that person in that relationship. But the thing about coercion that is different from other forms of control is that it instills fear in that person. So from time to time, there will be physical, sometimes sexual assaults as well, but there will be instilled fear and they live in that ongoing state of fear on a day to day basis. During that process, their options and choices are removed. And so they actually, it actually becomes very difficult for them to actually think for themselves. And they go through these stages. I'm going to talk about coercion mainly. And the reason I'm doing that is because it's the thing that is used most often but it is invisible and it is the thing that we really need to start to concentrate on more and more when we're supporting survivors of domestic abuse. These are the stages that I've just explained to you that Professor Liz Kelly calls a model of crisis intervention and it's really important when we're responding to a survivor of domestic abuse and we're going to come into the pandemic in a, in a few moments, that we understand these stages that victims, survivors of domestic abuse go through. Because if we understand the stages, we can recognise when we're speaking to a survivor what stage they're at. And it's really important that we respond at what stage they're at because otherwise we tend to lose them. So if it's early on in that relationship, they'll be managing it, adapting their own behaviour as I described and trying very hard to get that person back that they had at the beginning. And then you get that real distortion where that victim starts to blame themselves for their abuse. It's believing that it's about their behaviour and not that perpetrator's behaviour. And most importantly, is adapting their world to fit in to that perpetrator's world. They do get to the stage where they start to think and recognise that it is abusive, but this isn't a linear process. So they go up and down, up and down, up and down. So they might start to recognise it at abuse and then go all the way back down to managing that situation. And they can do this over and over and over again. And I don't think I need to remind everyone that it's on average between five and seven times that a survivor, a victim will leave an abusive relationship and return back to that relationship. And that is because they're often returning on promises of change and this is what they want to hear and this is what they want to believe. And in between all this, they're being given occasional indulgences that keep them there. And that, that belief that that person is going to change and can change will make them stay there longer and longer. But eventually, they do reevaluate that relationship and they end that relationship. And I don't need to tell you the majority of the people in the room today that ending the relationship does not end the abuse. It's the most dangerous time. It's the time when serious harm and homicides happen and it takes a long time to recover afterwards because upon separation, you get stalking, you get harassing behaviour, uh, you get child contact arrangements, you get all those things that perpetrators can use to continue to further abuse victims of, of domestic abuse. This is why it's really, really difficult um, to evidence and particularly in the pandemic, and I will say it's not just down to the police to evidence co control and coercive behaviour. It's down to all professionals to understand it and be able to evidence it in their records. What we're looking at is victims of domestic abuse living in absolute fear on a daily basis. We do know that it has to that they have that fear of either being um, physically abused or psychologically abused has to happen more than twice in order for them to prosecute it. But we also know that it causes and we have to evidence the serious alarm or distress. So it's about the adverse effect on that day to day person's activity. Survivors of domestic abuse change and adapt their activities 
all the time in order to stay safe. And they do it in lots of different ways. And unless we have a conversation with them about it, we're not going to learn about it. There's some comments there in that side box from victims that we've spoken to during the pandemic. And they've said that they're very lonely, they feel isolated and that they feel like a sitting duck in their own home. They don't know from one day to the next what's going to happen. They don't know whether they're going to be physically attacked, sexually abused. They don't know if their children are going to be harmed and they feel as if there's absolutely nothing that they can do about it. They're saying there, when they've been abusive, there was no one that they felt could come and help because of lockdown, because of self-isolation. They felt that they had no one to tell and that they were extremely desperate. Just to know with coercive and controlling behaviour that the victim has to be fearful. So one of the questions that we need to ask is how people are feeling. When we look at coercion, we know that the abuse is very personalised. It's a continuous course of conduct. It's always there because it has different strategies that are used daily in different ways. We know that especially during the pandemic, it's really restricted victims' free will. It's entrapped them in that relationship even more. And what they're telling us is they're punished, being punished even more. The thing about coercion is that it always has a punishment attached to it. Controlling and coercive behaviour has a punishment attached to it. So someone isn't necessarily being physically abused every day. That physical abuse can happen when they step outside of those rules and norms that have been created within that relationship. And that is what the punishment is. The punishment doesn't have to be physical. It can be absolutely anything. It can be what that perpetrator has learned will affect that survivor the most. I could give you examples, lots of examples. Uh, one in particular that I remember that caused that survivor to be absolutely distraught. She was a Bangladeshi woman and she had been planning her sister's wedding in Bangladesh for many months. She was in an abuse a relationship in England and the week before her sister's wedding, they were due to travel to Bangladesh for the wedding. It was a huge event. She was part of it. And the week before that, that wedding occurred, she gave her husband a meal that he didn't like. And she was told that he knew that he didn't like it. And her punishment for giving him the wrong meal was that the, he cancelled the flights to the wedding. He had total control over finances. She had no way of getting there. And she didn't go to that wedding. Now, what she said to me was that she'd actually been beaten quite a few times by him in the past and she would rather have taken that beating than miss her sister's wedding. And he knew that. He knew how important that was. And that is why we always encourage practitioners, whoever you are, wherever you are, wherever you're working, whatever field you're working, is to ask the questions. When survivors say to you, I can't do that, I don't do that. What would happen if? What do you believe would happen if? What has happened in the past? Because they will tell you and it's not necessarily going to be physical abuse. So it's really, really important that we ask those questions and allow and give the time for them to take to tell us exactly what's going on in that relationship and how that perpetrator is using parts of what they believe would would be most harm to that person and how they're using it. That's part of your of your evidence. When it comes to COVID-19, COVID-19 does not cause domestic abuse. What it's actually done is close down 
almost every avenue, every route to safety that a woman had to escape. So women that are in lockdown are with their abuser often 24 seven and they don't get a breathing space. When it comes to children, child survivors are no longer going to school and nurseries because of lockdown. They don't have that respite, but most importantly, children neither do they have that avenue to disclose. We know that children disclose domestic abuse at schools to the teachers, to a trusted person. And actually, children as young as nursery age do disclose domestic abuse. They talk about it in their age appropriate way. Sometimes they draw pictures. So that avenue for them has been closed as well. I'm wanting to share with you um, some research that we did in the summer and we've done a piece since, but it's not published, which shows very similar things here. Um, and it was particularly um, around COVID-19 and survivors experiences of um, living with abuse in COVID-19. We covered three areas here. We wanted to look at ways in which abusers had used COVID as a tool for domestic abuse, ways in which choices and the needs of women experiencing domestic abuse had been impacted by COVID-19 and ways in which COVID-19 actually affected our services because they are the services that you um, refer into. So it's useful for you to know that the impact that it had on the services as well. During the first two weeks of lockdown, 10 women and two children were killed by their partner or ex-partner. That was three times higher than the national average of three women killed every two weeks. Over 90% of survivors who responded to the piece of research said that the pandemic had negatively impacted in at least one way on them. Of those living with their abusers during lockdown, over half of them said that the abuse had got worse. More than two thirds of them said that they felt that they had absolutely no one to turn to during the lockdown. When we look at how perpetrators use the pandemic um, as a tool, they were saying that their abuser had refused to take precautions against the virus and that had instilled even more fear in them. A lot of them were telling us that their abuser had made them feel bad for being scared about COVID. A third of them were saying that their abuser had blamed them for the economic impact of COVID-19 on their household. And that was actually regardless of whether uh, the perpetrator or the survivor had lost their job or had been furloughed. It didn't matter either or they were being blamed for it. A lot of the fears around um, COVID-19 were the fact that they were really frightened that they contracted it, that they could no longer look after their children if they did, and that also that their abuse would worsen if they became ill. They, there's someone there in the, in, the, in the side there that had said that she was shielding, she was having to shield because of a medical condition and the, her partner was refusing to get her any food or any medication that she needed. And that was part of the control that he then had. Um, he had much more access to things. So he was using the thing again, that I'm saying that would have most effect on that person Someone was saying there that their ex-partner had used his knowledge of the reduced support networks to escalate the abuse on her um, even more, knowing, thinking that she had absolutely no one to turn to. When they talked about increasing isolation and fear, they said that it had got a lot worse. They'd felt much more intensive uh, feelings of, of being afraid, no one to turn to, no friends, no family. Um, they'd said that 
they felt that no one would come, they had no one to tell, and they got they were very desperate in their own homes. When it comes to daily activities, these were some of the examples that they talked about. So what perpetrators were doing was stopping their only means of outside activities. So they were stopping them from shopping. They were using all sorts of different reasons and they still are, may I add. Um, they were saying that they felt that uh, they were too afraid that they would contract uh, COVID if they went shopping, that they wouldn't be able to wear the mask properly. They didn't know what to do outside, what was safe, what was unsafe. They stopped them when the schools were open, taking the children to school. They stopped them visiting the chemists or the doctors. Now, some of you might know about Operation Annie that is currently operating in chemists. So that is, um, that is a, an operation that is advertised to survivors that says if you are living with ex, um, experiencing domestic abuse and you want to tell someone and share it with someone, you want to ask for support, you can actually go into the chemist and you can ask to speak to Annie and those people in the chemist understand what that means and will take you into a side room that they usually use um, to discuss prescriptions um, and people's medical health. But they were being stopped going anywhere. They were stopped going to GP appointments. So they were frightening them by saying that they'd been in contact with someone with COVID outside. So therefore they had to isolate for 10 days. And then after that 10 days, they were going out again and telling them that they'd been in contact with someone else as well. They were changing their, their usual routines at home um, that were associated with mealtimes or chores. They were insisting on over disinfecting. And quite a lot of survivors said this, that they were having to clean and infect far more than they did usually and that it was exhausting them. So this is why it's really important to ask when they tell you things, how did that make you feel? How did that affect you? Um, what was it that you did that was different to what you normally do? So they were doing it in the guise of protection. And then the other thing that they were doing that a lot of you will know that you get with, with domestic abuse is high levels of surveillance. This is really, really common. And what they did do then was stay at home. So even those that were essential workers, they were giving their workplace reasons that they had to work from home. And that meant that they were there 24 seven. The survivors are not being allowed to go out, but they're trapped in their homes with their perpetrator. All of these coercive strategies, survivors are telling us, is really affecting their mental health and general well-being, um, and the children as well. Um, they they said that they felt much more anxious than they had been previously. So, when we come into contact with them um, during the pandemic and outside of the pandemic, we really need to be asking about how things are affecting them and how they're feeling. And we will learn much, much more by asking those questions about those adverse effects that it's having on the daily activities. Other survivors were saying that it was bringing back memories of past abuse. So over half of them had said that the pandemic had triggered memories of abuse um, and affected their mental health. So they were remembering things from past and other relationships, but also this one, they were feeling much more afraid. 13% of them said that their um, abusers had made contact again because of the pandemic. So we're talking about uh, women here now that had separated from their abuser and their abusers were then using that pandemic to contact them again. And they were doing it for different reasons. They were saying it because they were concerned. They were asking if they could come back into their lives. There are some quotes on the side there, survivors own voices again saying, living with my ex-partner felt like being imprisoned in my home. It brought back those feelings of fear, loneliness and isolation. So what they were saying is that uh, 
even those that were separated because of the way that lockdown had isolated them from their communities and their families, they actually felt as if they were back in that relationship as well. Much more anxious about going out, more worried um, that their partner could find them um, and um, find them as because they were outside of the normal routines. So for those that had operated in with other routines in order for their partner not to be able to find them they felt that they were put at more danger because they were had to operate now outside of their normal routines when we come to child survivors of domestic abuse we've got women there we've got one there saying that she's got two small children and they're actually experienced more abuse as they're witnessing it more and that is because they're in lockdown with their abusers another woman saying there that her biggest concern was that her child may be given back to their abuser if she was if she was to become ill with coronavirus so there were some survivors actually saying as well that they were frightened that if they became ill that their abuser would end up looking after their children on their own so 51 percent there are over half of them told us that their children had witnessed more abuse 37 had said percent had said that their abuse would shown an increase in abusive behavior that was directed towards children and 47 expressed this fear that the children will be left alone with the abuser if they became ill. So those intense fears weren't just around themselves, it was also around their children. When it came to escaping, leaving their abusive partners, um, three quarters of them had said that the pandemic had made it much harder for them to be late to leave. And I think we all are probably very much aware of that. Um, in June, just under half of them uh, living with the abuse still felt that they couldn't leave or get away because of the pandemic. And even when we've been through these periods of lockdown being reduced and then being increased, it hasn't changed very much actually for survivors of domestic abuse because of the pandemic tactics that perpetrators have been using. They've been using them regardless of whether those lockdown uh, restrictions have been reduced or not. There's got someone there saying that they're working from home. Uh, their partner is a key worker, but being home all the time that they've been with them um, and leaving hasn't been something that they consider. Things are escalating and they just can't consider the fact uh, and think about leaving. When it comes to child contact, arrangements. We know that perpetrators are using child contact in the pandemic as well. So some of them are not returning children. They're saying that they've had to isolate if they've if they've had contact and they've taken them back to their home uh, because they've been in contact with someone who's tested positive. So they've used that as a reason to keep the children there. Or they've said that one of the children have become ill and they believe that the symptoms that they've got have been COVID symptoms, so they're not returning the children. Uh, perpetrators have also accused mothers of uh, parental alienation. We're going to have a look at that in a minute. Perpetrators are very aware of that term now and how that works. And it's very difficult here because lots of other countries starting point with child contact is the presumption that no contact takes place if there has been domestic abuse. So initially it's actually deemed very unsafe for child contact to take place and that perpetrator has to do some defined work in order for that contact to start again. So they are using COVID around that. We've had that, the National Helpline have reported back that they've had distressed mothers on the phone saying that their partners have refused to return the children, that they were frightened, um, but they didn't know whether or not they were telling the truth or not. They believed they were, that they were being untruthful in order to keep the children longer. Whilst I've got you here, I thought it would be good to capture when we look at children and domestic abuse what that looks like in the world of a survivor 
Because when a survivor is experiencing domestic abuse, uh, Professor Marion Hester um, explains it as the world of a three planet model for them. And I think this really helps people grasp the quandary that survivors of domestic abuse are placed in when it comes to their children as well. And I want you to think about this in terms of the pandemic as well, because we know that the court services, criminal and civil uh, court services are not operating like they usually do. So inside the world of a survivor experiencing domestic abuse, she sits in between these three planets all the time. So we have what we call the domestic violence planet, and that's where you see civil and criminal law considered. And we've got what we call the child protection uh, planet, where you've got the welfare of children and you get state intervention. And then you've got the child contact planet, and that's where private law comes in. And things like mediation and contact are negotiated. What happens on the domestic violence planet is that we have refuges that enable women and children to escape from abusive partners. We have other support and advocacy services that are offered. We have the criminalization of domestic abuse. So perpetrators are hopefully held to justice. Orders are put in place to protect the family. We have male perpetrator programs that some are mandated through court orders and some voluntary, and those programmes are run in the hope to challenge and change violent and abusive behaviour. The focus on this planet is on the violent male partners because they need to be contained in order for women and children to be safe. So there are criminal and civil measures that provide those interventions. On this planet, the focus is very much put on that violent male partner, and that is to ensure the safety of the survivors and their children. When we come to the child protection planet, we have the local authority who have a statutory duty to protect children. We have public laws that deal with child protection. And the emphasis on the child protection planet is on the welfare of the child, quite rightly. So professionals, when we come into contact with survivors, we encourage mothers to leave that relationship. We emphasise the risk to the children and we, we sometimes suggest um, that they possibly move to a different area as well in order to protect their children. So the focus then gets put on the mother to protect the children. Sometimes, unfortunately, she is told that if she doesn't leave that relationship, she can be seen as failing to protect her children. So she might start to fear children and young people services and the children then actually become more vulnerable to abuse from the father. On this planet, despite professionals identifying that the threat of violence comes from the perpetrator, it is often the mother who's seen as responsible for dealing with the consequences and the perpetrator can, if we're not careful, become very invisible. So she feels responsible. She feels that it's her that has to protect those children. And when we come to the child contact planet, we have domestic violence seen as an issue now for parents to resolve. So we're talking about residence and contact orders for children. There's much less emphasis placed on child protection, although obviously we do know that the courts do look at the harm effect um, to children. And there's more of an idea that the child should have two parents, that an abusive father is often deemed as a good enough father. And I'm not suggesting in any way, shape or form that fathers should not be allowed to see their children. Um, I'm suggesting that we really need to make sure that this is really safe. So a good enough father who should have contact post-separation. So once this couple have separated, once those orders in place, 
there is a, a general belief that if work is done with the father, etc., that he will be able to have contact with his children. Children might attend child contact centres and supervised contact centres initially, but generally that leads to unsupervised contact. Unfortunately, the mother is at further risk of abuse when she's handing over those children. We do know that mothers do get um, abused during handing over during contact um, issues. And the mother can now be criminalised, actually, if she doesn't abide by the court's judgment. So if a mother refuses and says, I, I know what you're saying, but I actually believe this is really dangerous, she can. So the emphasis now is on the children's rights and obviously children do have rights to know both parents. What, off, what then happens is the mother takes all the professional advice. So she calls the police and she supports, she supports the prosecution as she's being advised on the domestic violence planet. She leaves the relationship as advised on the child protection planet and on the domestic violence planet as well, actually. And she's now ordered to have contact between her valent partner and the children as instructed on the child protection planet. It really does leave her confused and fearing because she'll say, I've listened to all this and people telling me how dangerous it was for me to stay with this person because of the danger to myself and the children as well. And now I'm being forced into contact. I don't really understand it. Sometimes they can be labelled as hostile witnesses or they can be accused of parental alienation if they refuse contact, when in actual fact what they're doing is trying to safeguard their children. Um, you can see a quote there in the family court, my solicitor advised me not to apply for a non-molestation order because it would make her look like she would be hostile towards contact. Another one there, the criminal court convicted him and that was good, but the family court, in my opinion, enabled him to keep perpetrating. So this is food for thought when we're having those conversations and how might we better have them in order to be far more supportive to survivors when they're thinking about their children. I want to come on to now the services that have been impacted on COVID as well, because we support survivors our specialist services support survivors through all the processes that I've just described, through all their experiences that they experience in COVID, pre-COVID, and we will post-COVID as well. But um, service providers have reported that the capacity to support survivors was greatly impacted and actually still is by COVID-19. There's been challenges around caring roles, negative impact on mental health, challenges on repairing for remote working, and most importantly, making it safe during COVID. They've had the reduced availability of refuge services and move on accommodation during lockdown, sometimes because of the self-isolation that has to take place, bringing survivors in and out of refuges. And I don't need to say about future demand. Um, the big worry is that when lockdown eases, we're going to have a huge demand for services and that will apply to everyone listening um, today. These are some examples um, of more quotes here. There's one woman that said there that her partner actually said to her, do you know what, I could kill you. And actually nobody would know because we're not in contact with anyone anymore. Uh, there was much, many more women referred to our community based services that have needed much longer term and more in depth support than before the, the pandemic. And this was because of the anxiety that I was describing um, and the effects that being in lockdown with the partners um, have had. So we've got to work together. Um, these are some things to consider as we come out of the pandemic. There will be an increase in hidden harms and there has been, particularly during lockdown. There has been delays to the criminal justice um, system and criminal justice proceedings. There's been difficulties in keeping up levels of provisions from services. There may be a spike in reports after lockdown um, and 
COVID has had a disproportionate effect on survivors of domestic abuse. So never before has there been a greater need for statutory and voluntary agencies to work together. And we know this will happen. We know that there's lots of national meetings going on right across the services, thinking and looking about what is going to happen when we actually come out of lockdown. I want to touch on, because when we do come out of lockdown, hopefully at some point this year, um, we are hopefully as well going to have um, the introduction of the Domestic Abuse Bill, which is a once in a generational opportunity to transform the response to domestic abuse. Um, there are different things that are going to that are being proposed that hopefully will get royal assent and will happen. And one is that we're going to have a statutory, to, a statutory definition of domestic abuse, what domestic abuse is. We've already got a new domestic abuse commissioner that, and she is working very hard um, and will work very hard to make this happen. We're going to have uh, a new domestic abuse protection order. There is going to be a statutory duty placed on local authorities to fund support in safe accommodation. There's going to be protection for victims and witnesses in court. So there's going to be the barring of cross-examination in the family and civil courts. There's going to be access to special measures in the criminal courts, the family courts and the civil courts, which is new. Part six, offences involving violent and abusive behaviour. There's going to be the removal of the rough sex defence and there's going to be the enabling of the extraterritorial jurisdiction for violence against women and girls offences. Part seven, generally, uh, general, there's going to be polygraph testing for perpetrators. They're placing Claire's Law, which is a domestic violence disclosure scheme on a statutory footing. So it's going to be statute. The guarantee that all survivors that are in priority need and secure lifetime tenancies for survivors forced to flee. Those are extremely important parts of the bill and Women's Aid truly embrace them all. And I'm sure a lot of the people that are listening um, today are also embracing that as well. There are still some things missing. It doesn't at the moment afford full and equal protection for migrant women. Um, and we are concerned about that. We um, want to support amendments that are proposed to step up. Uh, we're campaigning um, that all victims within secure immigration status can establish safe reporting mechanisms that separate reporting crime from immigration enforcement. Um, and we want to include a non-discrimination clause in the bill. Uh, improving statutory duty on local authorities to support accommodation based refuge. We want that to come with real clear definitions of what refuge and specialist support really is. Um, and we want robust national oversight and sufficient funding for that to happen. Reversing the presumption of contact in the family courts, which I've already mentioned, where there are allegations of domestic abuse banning local connection restrictions for survivors when accessing houses, housing. The reason that we want that banned is because if and when local authorities put restrictions on survivors remaining in their local authority area, that takes away every bit of support that that person has, including the children as well. So extended family, uh, close friends and relationships that they've developed. So we want that banning so that they can stay in the area with their friends and with their family. We want paid employment leave for survivors and reforms to universal credit and the benefits. And we want a reform of joint tenancy law as well to um, protect survivors. Finally, we think that domestic abuse should be prioritised by all statutory um, and vol voluntary agencies. And, you know, I believe it is. And I believe that we have some amazing partnership work um, that we do. Um, we want to do further work on uh, to understand the national trends and patterns um, of impact of policing responses during COVID. Um, 
with light domestic homicide pile and initial findings. Uh, we want to see much more on domestic homicide research because the figures are, quite, are too small at the moment. Um, we want to um, ideally, we want to see more evidence um, that emphasises the disproportionate impact on black and minoritised victims of domestic abuse. We want that covering and COVID related factors such as mental health and well-being. We want to do more research into that. Um, we are still hearing of inconsistent and patchy inconsistent practice. Uh, some survivors have said to us that they've been berated because they've not been able to wear a mask and we need people to have a much better understanding into the trauma history that some survivors carry. I've put in an example there of suffocation. When someone has tried to suffocate you and sometimes strangulation as well, the putting a mask onto your face um, can have dire consequences actually. It can really turn people um, into an anxious state and it's really important that we understand that there are quite a few survivors out there that cannot wear um, a mask. What we've done in our response um, to COVID during the pandemic is we've been very busy distributing emergency funding that has come from many donations from private donations, also from the Home Office, uh, which has enabled us to um, give emergency funding to our direct services. We're an umbrella organisation, so we support the services in England that operate refuges and community services. So we've done that. Um, it's helped them increase access to technology uh, and support with remote working. We've been able to expand our live chat service, um, which is a service that provides safe route and support for women during lockdown. And we've been able to work with our colleague in the sector, produce safety and support resources for survivors. We've done that and we've been able to put that into 15 different languages, and that includes uh, British Sign Languages as well. It's useful for you to know this um, because it's when survivors are in a remote world, it gives them more access to information. I want to um, end or before I give you um, the services, I want to end with survivors voices, which is really, really important. And these are what they're saying. I wanted to leave. However, COVID came into effect and it made it harder. Someone here, I am a key worker who is around COVID and have patience. So I don't feel like I could go home on, and stay with my parents. So that was the reason she's saying she can't leave her partner. Uh, more time at home magnifies the issues. You cannot get away from it. I have to work harder to keep him happy. These are all really concerning. When we are operating in that COVID world, I want us to be really conscious of the fact that however we are contacting, speaking, having conversations with survivors of domestic abuse, whether that be via email, whether that be on the telephone, whether that be remotely, it's really important that we are aware that that perpetrator can be monitoring what we are doing, especially if it's emails. So you can always encourage that person to set up a separate email um, that that perpetrator doesn't know about. If it's a telephone conversation, they may be listening in. If it's an email or a text message, they may be looking at the text messages. So it's really important when we start to operate um, in that world or we are operating in that world that we think about those consequences and that we have those discussions and make sure that as far as we possibly can that when we are having contact in whatever mode we are having contact we are doing it as safely as we absolutely possibly can and that means asking that survivor what is the best and safest way for me to contact you what would happen if do they have access to your emails, to your text messages, etc.? That shouldn't stop, hopefully, giving advice out. Um, what survivors have said is that they've really welcomed um, and embraced 
being given information where they can that they can go to remotely and most of the services that are offered to survivors of domestic abuse have um, leave buttons attached to them at the top. So if they're on the screen and the perpetrator comes into the room, they can click on that button and it will go to something else. So they won't be able to see it. I'm giving you England here, but these are similar in Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. So wherever you are, I'm suggesting that you look those directories up. Some of you, you can use professionally. We have a national, undirect, uh, national directory of domestic abuse services that contains absolute up-to-date information about all the domestic abuse services across the UK. So that includes refuges as well. And as a professional, you can access it with this link. We have a survivor's handbook. You can give that link to survivors and they can read about um, safe, how to work safely, how to um, how to safety plan safely um, and much, much more. We have a forum that they can go on to that is a safe space for them. And we have a live web chat that has a direct link to experts that can uh, give them advice and support. That is only in office hours only. We do support by email as well and we make sure that we're doing it safely. We also give everyone information on how to cover the tracks online for the very reasons that I have been um, explaining to you. I'm not going to go through these as well, but there are national support services and helplines, um, and some of those are specifically to highly specialised services that some survivors will need around immigration issues, etc. And then we have our what we call our buying for services and they're run for uh, by, uh, for example, Jewish Women's Aid is, is run by Jewish women for Jewish women. So we have lots of buying for services that some survivors will prefer. It's very important that we always give them a choice and those options, but it is run by and for with them. So there's lots of information that is a link to bit the piece of research which will give you it all the perfect storm. We have a COVID-19 impact resource hub and obviously you can contact us at any time you wish. That's our policy department. That is the training department. I want to thank you for listening um, and I hope that um, you got something from this and I'm guessing that if you have any questions, I'm very happy, very happy indeed um, to answer any questions. So thank you.